We're looking at Jesus' parables. And a parable is a story with a twist, a twist which reveals something about God and our relationship with him. And a number of these stories have to do with our relationship with possessions. And that's what we'll find today. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Jesus is addressed as a teacher, a title that shows people viewed him as a respected rabbi. There was no separation between church and state in Israel, so the lawyers were religious leaders, and it was common then for a teacher to rule on a matter of law. In this case, a brother who wanted to appeal to Jesus to tell or to instruct his brother to divide an inheritance that had come. And um, after Jesus fails to rule on this question, he pauses to issue a warning. That's what he said. And he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. The warning is given to everyone, not just the person who asks the question. Disciples are broadly warned to be on your guard, not just against money, but against all forms of greed. The word greed literally means the desire to have more. So that's what greed is, no matter what it has to do with money or esteem, accomplishments, successes. Greed is the desire to have more, the need to have more in order to feel happy, in order to feel okay. Um, Jesus drives the point home with a parable. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. This farmer would have been kind of seen as being especially blessed by God. The harvest for the year was exceptional, leaving him in a really favorable situation. It's important to note, though, that there is no sense with this guy of cheating or doing something wrong. No sense of immorality. He seems to have come by his wealth honestly. And because he comes by it honestly, it's a little bit disturbing then the, the, in the course of Jesus' comments. Uh, he pictures this guy, explains this guy as, well, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. The problem is he doesn't have enough storage space in his present barn, so he develops a plan to expand his storage capabilities so that he will be able to um, not lose what he has. He will replace his barns with larger ones. And after this expansion, he will have the places to store not only his grain, but other goods that need to be stored. And the parable pictures a man apparently making prudent, efficient plans. Not anything really wrong with this. Um, there are some thoughts and attitudes, though, that bubble to the surface. And the thing that the Bible talks about God's judgment is not necessarily or not really specifically towards what we do, but why we do what we do. If you think there are thoughts, attitudes, and actions. Actions are what we do. Attitudes influence why we do what we do. And thoughts are those basic beliefs that lead to our attitudes. So thought leads to attitudes and attitudes lead to actions. When we judge one another in a court of law, we really can only judge actions. We don't judge thoughts and attitudes. And that's the way horizontal 
judgment occurs because I can't see what you're thinking. You can't see what I'm thinking unless we disclose it. With God's judgment, that's why his judgment is different. He doesn't judge what we do, but really why we do what we do, not the actions, but the attitudes and the thoughts. That's what God judges, and that's what we end up tuning into as we see not what this guy is doing, because there's not much wrong with it, but why he's doing what he's doing. That's what becomes the focus. Um, and we see a couple of things. The We see him my barn, my goods, my soul. There's definitely a selfishness. But, you know, on the other hand, if you work really hard, it's not uncommon for you to see the fruits of your labor as being yours. You know, I did this. I worked for this. And that's what this guy did. Uh, so there is a selfishness about him. Um, and the Bible does tell us about that. It talks about people who are rich. Um, that's what it says. Command those who are rich in this present world uh, to not not to be arrogant, but to nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up for themselves treasures as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. With respect to the goods that this person has amassed, the Bible doesn't indicate that money is evil, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And so what it would indicate then, somebody who loves God and puts their hope in God, rather than putting their hope in money, will evidence that one way by being generous and willing to share, not hoarding, not stocking. And we might see that this guy then is culpable because that's kind of what he wants to do. He wants to kind of gather it up and amass it. Um, the man's actions, again, are not judged, but what happens is his attitude and his motive. He wants to take it easy and eat and drink and be merry. He wants to accumulate what he's accumulated so that he can use it to bankroll pleasure, relaxation. And that's the, it's, it's not what he was thinking. It's what he was thinking, not what he was doing that ends up being the problem. And here's what God ends up saying to him. God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. A fool is a person who either acts without God or acts without wisdom. It's somebody who is assuming that I only need to worry about this when there's a whole raft of things to be concerned about. There are two questions which this guy fails to take into consideration seriously, and Jesus kind of brings those to the surface. First, who will possess the things he has prepared for himself? This night, his soul is demanded of him, and those things that he has accumulated, that he's going to reap the benefits of, who's going to be able to experience them? Because he's not going to be able to. That's one thing. Second thing is, how will he settle accounts with God? There's a sense of accountability for the life that was given him. And um, God demands an account of the man's mortal soul, his grain and wealth cannot pay his debt. I heard somebody put it this way, divine scrutiny of the life given will not be concerned with barns bursting at the seams. What he would commend as being, boy, I'm in a really good spot, is not the same thing that he's going to be able to express to God. He might point out barns bursting at their seams, but that's not going to be a satisfactory answer for God. This is a, you can't take it with you parable. How do we apply this? What do we do with this? 
Is it okay to retire? Is it okay to have a retirement account? Is it okay to get storage units? It's, and we, we can't just think about what we do, but why we do what we do. Let's do a couple of applications. Number one, let's apply it at the time when Jesus spoke it. Let's apply it in the first century. The cost of following Jesus in the first century was heavy. And those who left their families to follow Jesus as disciples in the first century paid a pretty heavy price for doing so. Uh, Jesus had a couple things to say, and I'm going to point out a couple verses in the Bible. I believe these are shepherd verses. The Bible has some shepherd verses and some sheep verses. Shepherd verses are verses that are directed to those in positions of spiritual influence. Those in positions of spiritual influence at Jesus' time had a heavier level of authority that was more expected. Jesus has some very hard things to say. I don't think he's speaking to sheep who I think he's speaking to shepherds. Here's one of them. Remember, those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side be side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized, sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. In the first century, to choose to be a disciple of Jesus and to choose to be a Christian was to commit financial suicide. You were choosing not to walk a path that would allow you to make a good living because all that happened in the synagogue. And in the first century, if you as a Jew become a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you were no longer welcomed into the synagogue. And that was the place that you interacted with people socially. And that's the place you made business agreements. And so you were walking away from social security into social insecurity. That's not always the case today. In the first century it was. And those then who wanted to be able to pad a comfortable lifestyle, at that time it was not possible to do that and to be a follower of Jesus. Um, a little bit different today, and all we're doing, we're going we're gonna to apply it to today, but let's apply it to the original context in the first century. Um, large crowds traveled, were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. We look at a verse like this and say, what in the world is Jesus wanting? Again, I don't think this is spoken to people who aren't putting themselves in a place of spiritual leadership and spiritual influence in the first century, those who were going to be Jesus' disciples then, they were going to, as they followed Jesus, following Jesus meant walking away from family. Because again, to follow Jesus in a place where sacred law was civil law, when you, when you went against the government and the government was predicated upon you have to do what the Pharisees and the religious leaders are telling you to do. And if you don't do that, you become a criminal. So in that context, to follow Jesus really was to become a criminal. And if you had a son or daughter or a brother or sister who followed Jesus, that would have made trouble for your family. Why aren't you keeping your brother in line? He's following this person. And, and so to make a choice to follow Jesus in the first century then, it was, it was going to produce problems in the family. It was going to really influence your relationship with your neighbors and the government. Um, so in terms of first century application, it really wasn't possible to follow Jesus and make a bunch of money. What about in the 21st century, though? And um, we live in, uh, arguably, uh, one of the most 
affluent civilizations that has ever walked the planet. That's what I've read. It's um, on the far side of World War II. We living in America have had the luxury of not having wars on our soil. So we, in World War II, were able to turn our factories towards munitions, but then we didn't have to do a lot of recuperation on our soil, so we were able to turn those factories into um, factories to f form neighborhoods. And we've lived in, I've heard, one of the most sustained economic booms that that the world has ever existed. And um, it's just, we live in a time where we have the luxury of being able to be fairly affluent and, and have things. How can we keep from being greedy? I'm not just pointing a big bony finger at you. How can we keep from being greedy in a place where we have all kinds of stuff? And it's not a guilt question. I'm not trying to impose guilt. Really just asking if we want to do this and if we wanted to, how do we do it? Um, the solution that you hear most often is self-control. You have to kind of make yourself not be greedy. Uh, frankly, that's what society urges. That's what churches urge. Be self-controlled. Be really careful about it. The fact is, that's not the Bible's answer. When the Bible talks about what it takes to circumvent greediness, it doesn't tell you to be self-controlled. That can't be the focus, because that's not going to work. Money is very powerful, and so is so are possessions. Um, the Bible doesn't focus on self-control as a way to rein in the influence of pleasures and the influence of greed. What does the Bible focus on? If we wanted to be careful about our thoughts and attitudes, what should we do? The Bible talks about, it talks about, well, look at what it keeps your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? No God's strategy to circumvent greed is to place confidence in him. That's really simple. Within the context of confidence in God, you can experience pleasure and yet not be addicted to it, not to be dominated by desires. Um, we can say this, decrease vert vertical confidence in God. If we decrease vertical confidence in God, we increase horizontal craving. We're going to talk about this a little bit. Increased vertical confidence, decreased, excuse me, vertical confidence, increased horizontal craving. Increased vertical confidence, decreased horizontal craving. They have a adverse relationship, the greater our confidence, the less addicted we are to craving. Let's talk about that a little bit. Decrease vertical confidence. Uh, look what it says, Genesis. Did God really say, the serpent is talking to Eve, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Uh, the serpent's influence in the first parts of this verse is very crafty. What he basically says is you can't trust God. What did he say to you? He said, uh, don't eat fruit from the tree, you won't surely die. You know, God doesn't know what he's talking about. The deal is God doesn't want you to be like him, knowing good and evil. So basically what the serpent does is decrease Eve's ability to be confident in God. He doesn't have your best interests in mind. He's in it for himself. That's the foundation that was laid. God's purposes are self-serving. Decreasing confidence. Look what happened. Well, what does it say? When the woman saw 
that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also took, gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. What's the problem here? Is the problem that the fruit looked good? Is that a problem to like the way fruit looks? Absolutely not. He, God built us so that we can enjoy things. We can see things. We, we can taste things. And that's not the problem. What is the problem? The problem was that within the context of eroded confidence, Sensual things don't just look good, they are something we crave. Decreased confidence, increased craving. When we don't have someone to trust, somebody bigger than ourselves, just say no is not going to work. Doesn't work. Um, that's what we find. Uh, frightening to consider that this, the pull of things happened in, well, in a perfect world at the time. Sin hadn't entered yet. And still, the appeal of was overwhelming. Um, how much easier to challenge or to not be able to be confident in God when we don't live in a perfect world. We have all kinds of stuff, our mistakes and the mistakes other people make. Um, to decrease vertical confidence leads to increasing horizontal craving and the other way around, increased vertical confidence leads to decreased horizontal craving. What it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Grace means God doing something that we don't deserve, giving us the basis of being able to trust him, not because we've earned the things he's giving us, but because he just wants to give them to us, because that's his character. God gives. And what it says, the grace that brings salvation has appeared. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. What teaches us to say no to godliness and worldly passions? Self-control? No. What it says is grace teaches us to say no to that, to worldly passions. The more we understand and over time trust in, have confidence in what God says he'll do for us, it that will help us to say no to worldly passions. That's what it says here. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Interesting to me that, again, we talk this self-control is not the thing to cultivate. Self-control comes from a greater understanding of grace. That's what it indicates. Uh, grace that brings salvation has appeared. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, not just at the level of what we do, but at the, at the level of what we think, our thoughts about God, at the level of what our attitudes are, the greater our confidence is in him, Little by little, it forms an immunity against being carried away by greed. That's what Paul is suggesting here. Um, there are many who want to be, want to move away from being dominated by desires. If that is our goal, um, we're going to have to develop an interest in being confident of God's support. We're going to have to be serious about learning his promises, putting the weight of our confidence in what God promises to us, because with respect to something that's not going to just change what we do, but why we do it, that is what Paul suggests and Jesus is going to suggest is the answer. Increased vertical confidence 
leads to decreased horizontal cravings. Um, it says, at one time, Paul writes, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. We're going to close. There's an article that comes from Hebrews 13.5. If you want to follow along, I'm going to read that, and we'll, we'll think about that as we close. Uh, we can't live without money, but it's not okay to love it. How can we tell if we love money? It says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The decision to follow Christ cost the first Christians dearly. Converting from Judaism to Christianity amounted to committing financial suicide. In this honeymoon stage of their newfound faith, those believers had joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property because they knew they had better and lasting possessions. As time wore on, many Jewish Christians came to a crossroads. They found it increasingly difficult to offset the reality of earthly hardships with thoughts of heavenly bliss. Financial hardships made it increasingly difficult to hang on for heaven. Some of their friends were choosing to abandon Christianity in order to return to the financial security that Judaism afforded. Two roads stretched out before them. And the in money we trust road led them to find shelter in wealth from the uncertainties of life. The in God we trust road encouraged them to find refuge in God rather than in money. Keep yourselves free from the love of money and be content with what you have is an encouragement to trust in God and a warning against relying on wealth for provision and protection. Greed wasn't much of an issue for first century Jewish Christians. They didn't have enough money to prime the pump of greed. Greed wasn't their problem. Hopelessness was. Because they lacked material resources, they felt exposed and vulnerable, unprotected from the uncertainties of life. King Solomon was the king of Israel when the nation was at the zenith of its security and strength. He revealed that the pursuit of wealth is connected with the search for security. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it an unscalable wall. Solomon observed that wealth gives a sense of safety and security, like living in a fortified city or behind an unscalable wall. Money promises to protect and provide for those who seek shelter in it. In this respect, money makes God-like claims. God promises, never will I leave you, Never will I forsake you. He assures us that he will neither let us go nor leave us behind. Money also promises never to leave or forsake those who trust in it. The difference between God and money is that God keeps his promises. Solomon exposed the deceitful character of riches Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. We are constantly bombarded with messages linking wealth and security. We are encouraged to feel safe with money. This is a mistake. People who want to get, want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and heartful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Money is inherently addictive. Loving money is like loving narcotics, op opioids. Narcotics have beneficial properties. However, they are to be used cautiously. In full realization of their addictive properties, 
they possess. Money is a spiritual narcotic. Rather than hunker down inside a bank account, Solomon exhorts us to find refuge in God. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. God is a reliable source of security. This is why Solomon encourages us to transfer our trust from having money in our pocket to having God at our side. According to Jesus, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. When our backs are to the wall, we will either trust God or we will trust in money. Both promise not to leave or forsake you. One of them never will. Let's stand for closing prayer. <laughs> Father, we can't do without money, and it's prudent to, to try to put things away for the future, and you would have us. It's not about not doing that. It's about cultivating a vertical confidence. You want us to place our security in you. You promise never to leave and forsake us. And you will keep those promises. Money promises the same thing. I ask that, I guess what I would ask is more and more, you would give us the capacity to think about your promises and grow in our ability to trust them. That's not going to happen quickly. It means a consistent focus on what you promise us. That's ultimately the solution, not self-control. Would you cause your promises to become bigger and bigger in our minds? We might not understand them perfectly, but more and more, I pray that we'd be brilliant in them, understanding your commitments to us, not your commandments, your commitments to us. Because as our faith is rooted in commitments, our confidence in you increases and our need to put our hope in other things decreases. Thanks for that, in Jesus' name. Amen.